Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we are today at the knowledge exchange called Monetizing Trust, uh, best practices for a successful membership model. Um, thank you for joining. Let me tell you a little bit about the background of this initiative. Uh, this exchange is part of a series of exchanges between media houses. They are funded by UNESCO, carried out by Free Press and Limited, and ultimately the initiative is focused on contributing to media viability by offering media houses a platform to exchange more intimate knowledge on specific aspects of their business models. So to allow other media to benefit from this exchange as well, uh, we will uh, publish an ex uh, a recording on Free Press Unlimited's webpage. Um, in addition to the panelists, we have a few invited participants here today. I'm not sure which joined already, um, but Daraj from Lebanon and Mutant for Colombia signed up. And we also have Larry Kilman here, who represents UNESCO. Um, there were also quite a few media houses who could not attend, but they expressed an interest in receiving a link to the recording. Um, today, I'm also supported by my co-host, Isabel O'Farrell. So if you have any technical difficulties, you can just ask her in the chat. She can give you a hand. And if you have any questions, you can also add them there or through the Q&A function. And we will try to answer them at the end of the session. Um, so today's conversation discusses the membership model, and for this purpose we have with us Alina Radu. She is the CEO from Zero de Garda in Moldova. And we also have Enrique Castella Zorro and Cynthia Membreño, who are the CEO and Audience Loyalty Manager of Confidential in Nicaragua. Um, we will focus on what drives members, on how you can attract and maintain them, keeping your team together, and do's and don'ts in setting up a membership model. So I will now give the floor to Alina, Enrique, Cynthia. Um, Alina, if you can start with quickly introducing uh, Zero de Garda and the audience development, and then from there we can continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evelyn, and thank you everybody who joined us today. And Enrique, very glad that you got up in the morning with this goal. Uh, I am from Moldova and I am leading for now the biggest investigative reporting team. Uh, we have all the platforms possible like a print edition and the web page and the social media and we also are doing an investigative uh, video program that we spread on different TV channels in Moldova. Uh, this is the most expensive kind of journalism. That's why we are always interested to find money to support the great job our reporters are doing. And that's why I am interested to, to share experience and to learn from uh, uh, Confidential and from uh, everybody. Uh, just to be clear who we are and what we are doing, we are from a very small country. We're from the smallest and most corrupt and <laughs> Uh, poorest country in Europe, named Moldova. But uh, just, uh, I would like to share a video with you to show uh, what is our audience and our figures. So uh, uh, then we have questions and points to discuss. I'll share the screen. Uh, the video is one minute and there are all, or almost uh, the most important data about uh, our audience.
So this was the very short introduction of us. And uh, this is the point of the, of the discussion. Our audience is growing and growing, but how much money is coming from the audience? And uh, uh, do we use all the instruments and knowledge to ask the community to, to support us? And uh, this is the, the issue that we want to discuss. And I know that Confidential started the membership project and uh, it should be a nice experience to share with everybody. So Enrique, if you would like to just to introduce uh, yourself and Confidential in a few words, and then we discuss uh, small things. Sure, thank you, Alina, for the invitation. Uh, we're very happy to, to be part of this discussion. My name is Enrique Gastiasoro. I'm the CEO for Confidencial. Confidencial is one of the leading independent media outlets from Nicaragua. We focus on investigative and narrative journalism, but we also, over the last few years, have grown to do more breaking news coverage just because we have identified that there, is, there was a gap left in our market by the closure of several media outlets due to the very harsh circumstances for freedom of expression in Nicaragua over the last couple of years. So that's kind of been a change for us since 2018. Uh, Confidencial is a media outlet that has been doing narrative and investigative journalism in Nicaragua for 25 years, actually. This is our, the year of our 25th anniversary. But like I mentioned before, uh, there has been a, a very marked digital transformation over the last four years due to sort of contextual and structural circumstances in Nicaragua. I'm talking about repression and censorship on, on the one hand, but also very intense migratory flows that have increased and also obviously a very deep economic crisis that has accompanied this uh, political and human rights crisis that Nicaragua has been undergoing over the last couple of years. And I'm very happy to also be joined here by my colleague, Cynthia Membreño, who is our audience loyalty manager and who is really the brain behind our membership model uh, from, its, from its early inception in 2019. So I think we'll be able to have some, some interesting uh, conversation about this. Yeah, thank you, Enrique. Yes, Cynthia, I would like... Uh... Uh, that you introduce yourself and uh, shortly, briefly, what is your job exactly? Okay. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for inviting us. I am Cynthia Mambreño, and I'm the audience loyalty manager. Um, I have to say that my experience is in journalism because I used to uh, work for Confidencial as a journalist in the past. So, but at some point I decided that I wanted to do something different and to explore the, the relationship between audience and the media from the sustainability side of things. Um, so in general, I'm in charge of the membership uh, program and in charge of, of the donation campaigns as well. I am the person who replies to the emails of our readers. So we would say that if you have a question about Confidencial, about um, you know, where to find um, an investigation or how to make a payment or how you can reach our journalist, anything that you come up with, I'm the one who will reply to the emails. Um, and also um, I have a close relationship with the different areas of the media outlet. So I'm like the person who's in the middle. Um, um, you know, um, promoting a conversation uh, based on how we can innovate our products, products and um, deepen the relationship with our audiences. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, let's go back to Enrique. I just would like to know and to understand your opinion um, about um, for whom is investigative reporting? Should we expose it for everybody? or should we provide it only to those who are able to pay because everything costs? Uh, how would it be better to offer it only to corrupt people who have money to pay or to offer it to poor who do not have money but need knowledge? Alina, I think this is a, this is a fascinating point. Uh, but before we get into the ability to pay or not, I think that it's, it's 
worthwhile to take a step back even because We've been doing a lot of reflecting within Confidencial, but also in speaking to other of our media outlets uh, that we are allied with, including Cerul de Garda a couple of weeks ago that we were able to exchange some knowledge with our colleagues at El Faro, colleagues at uh, outlets or, or at uh, investigative journalism, such as CLIP, the Latin American Center for Investigative Journalism. Uh, so the big question that we've been asking ourselves is, well, we are convinced and, we definitely believe, we are true believers in this idea that quality journalism empowers citizens and strengthens democracy. However, we have these examples of outlets such as ourselves. We've been doing this for almost three decades now in a society and a region where democracy, where the transition to democracy that was expected in the 1990s failed and where in the last 10 years, we've seen very intense democratic backsliding. So we've been asking ourselves, well, we've been doing quality journalism. Our audience has been growing, yet our society has not been, or the democracy in our society has not been strengthened as of late. So what is really the missing link? And we think that even before we get into the whole issue of who can pay for this kind of investigative journalism, given the sort of structural challenges in our societies, inequality, poverty, exclusion, et cetera, we really need to ask ourselves, well, not just who can pay, but who can read, who understands the importance of reading these kind of in-depth journalistic products. And we're really struggling a lot with this question right now. I'm struggling in a good sense, in the sense of trying to find ways to enhance the reach and the impact of our journalism by really getting out of our comfort zone. Because I think that for too long, quality investigative journalism has been appealing mostly to people who have high education standards. Uh, many times for those of us who are already kind of drawn to this, these issues such as human rights, such as democracy, such as anti-corruption struggles. So it, it really is a big challenge to, to get a critical mass of our audiences who are the citizens within our societies to connect and care about and understand and act uh, upon engaging with our quality content. And then having, having sort of set, set it up for the second part of the question, which was actually your original question, well, we definitely believe that access should be open. I mean, our journalism is journalism with no paywalls. It's a journalism where we believe that the impact and the social value or the public value of our work grows exponentially as more and more people come into contact with it, read it, and kind of internalize it and then use it as a motivator to participate more, uh, to make better decisions that affect their personal, their family, their community, their society as a whole. So definitely keeping the journalism open free for us is a priority, but uh, as it has been free for many years on our website, and like I said, uh, we're definitely not happy with the state of democracy in our society, we've come to the conclusion that keeping the journalism free and open is not enough, and that there's more than we need to do. We need to do more than producing quality journalism. We need to do more than distributing it openly and freely. What does that more look like? Well, we're constantly experimenting about that. Good, thank you. And let's now uh, go to the membership model. Uh, when did you start and uh, how does it, uh, what is the evolution? Are there more people from the beginning or do they join uh, after that? Or um, they, do they join when you publish an interesting story? How do you get in contact with them? Okay, so the membership model started after like an experiment that we did uh, in 2019 with our donation campaign. And the donation campaign started um, out of necessity, really, because in 2019, we were expelled from TV. Our offices were confiscated. And we were in a situation which we needed the support of the audiences. And I think before that, we were a bit hesitant 
about having a public um, donation campaign. But in January, when we had no office and no TV program, we said, let's give it a try. Let's see if the audiences are um, interested in supporting us in, you know, giving um, whatever amount they could give. And the response was very positive. So this campaign, I think, is one of the longest that we've had. It, it lasted for about a year. And I always joke to Enrique because we sent message, messages to our databases once a week for a year and nobody complained. <laughs> so um, we had, we had, I have to say this, this donation campaign um, was like um, un flujo, Enrique. How do you say that in English? Like a flow? Uh -huh, like a flow. So it varied throughout the year. And I think that um, almost after the year, we sent a survey asking the, don the, the donors and the, and, the, and the readers, the subscribers of our um, um, daily newsletter, if they were interested in becoming part of a membership program. And uh, I think it was more than 50% of people who said they were willing to do it. So we said, okay, we have the go. So let's, let's imagine how we would look. And um, so we officially launched the program in July, 2020. And from then on, if you look at the donation campaign and the membership program, what you see is that there is constant support, but usually, the biggest support is when we're in the in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so, for example, this year it has been more steady, but it all but you see a, 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 a high amount of members and and economic contributions after we were confiscated for the second time, and we launched a campaign to ask our readers to help us recover our our equipment. And so I think we will we will talk more about good practices, but I think that from that moment on, we could see that it was very stable and that it was true what other experts told us that after two years, two, uh, yeah, about two or three years, that it becomes more stable. So this is not a speed competition. It's more like an endurance competition. And I think that is like the biggest message that you have to have in mind with the membership program. It takes a lot of patience. Just, just to give you um, like a, a very concrete benchmark of, of the kind of, of growth that Cynthia is talking about moving into kind of our third year, the membership model as such is really only a year and a half old but when you add that experimentation project with the crowdfunding campaign we're talking at about three years so in the period between uh, November sorry between oh, hold on. there we go between November 2019 and October 2020 uh, we had about 326 uh, not necessarily members but 326 contributions. Some of those were membership, some of those were donations, some of those came from the same person. So we're just talking about single contributions, let's call them 326 in that period between November 2019 and October 2020. Between November 2020 and October 2021, the number of single contributions grew by 243%. So we grew to about 1,100 single contributions from 326. And the total amount that we uh, managed, like our total income from this effort grew by almost 200%. So that's, that's the growth that we have seen in the last 12 months. And it's, it really is, I mean, we're increasingly convinced that it really is based on those first two years where growth was slower so that's what I think that's what Cynthia is talking about when she says it really is like an endurance race. You have to be there. You have to have a long enough or a big enough runway 
to be able to start growing more exponentially. Very interesting. Thank you. Yes, and when Cynthia said about uh, hesitancy and uh, you were shy, it, happened, it just was the same with us. Uh, we started a Patreon account uh, in, uh, in 2020 and we were really not sure that it will work because at that moment already almost of the news organizations in the country had um, a Patreon account and we thought you know there is a critical mass who is going to support the media and maybe all of them are already busy with other media and I was really really surprised it worked from the first day and actually we publish our hard stories every Thursday and every Thursday at least one new person joins the project to support and to donate for us and this is uh, uh, advice number one don't be shy <laughs> just try <laughs> uh, and then uh, the second uh, you seen them mentioned that people join more when you are in deep troubles <laughs> it is a problem we should not be in that deep troubles and you are guys in real trouble uh, working from abroad uh, did you feel like a kind of incommodation to tell the audience that you you are in troubles? Never. I think it was also evident because it was in the news that we had been confiscated and that we were expelled, that some of our the members of our team were in exile. I think that was, I mean, it was communicated through our um, TV shows that for example our director had to had to go into exile in costa rica and then you know to communicate that other members of our team did so as well and that was the first time and then the second time also sharing that information so i think people are very aware and of course um we i mean not only in the tv show we also do it uh, on our website in our opinion columns when Carlos Fernando Enrique um, wrote an article about the experience of um, having a hybrid newsroom and operating from two countries. So I think we haven't been shy about that, but in the beginning we were afraid a little bit about the impact that going public was going to have in terms of what, how the government was going to react. Mm -hmm. Because with this government, we have seen that if they want to make up a story of how you um, are doing something illegal in their terms, they will, they will make it up. And they will um, have um, you know, laws that help them frame it as a legal action. Um, but you know, that cannot stop you because yeah. if not, then how are you going to get closer with the audiences and how are you going to get the support? I think you have to take, uh, you have to take the risk. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So maybe also Alina, just, I also think that it's important to differentiate between these very specific crisis moments where like Cynthia said, it's evident to everybody that we're, we're being attacked. I mean, it, it was evident to everybody that our first office was confiscated. It was evident to everybody when our, uh, our director or other people from our team had to leave to exile for the first time in 2019 or for the second time in 2021. These things have been very evident, uh, but I do think that we are still a little shy about framing the, the need for this support at a more macro level. We still have not ventured into the kind of campaign where we say, well, uh, it takes X amount of money to yeah. run Confidencial each year. And our goal, and right now, 75% of that is funded through projects and grants. Uh, and three years ago, it used to be 50% funded by projects and grants because we had a very strong ad operation that has vanished in the last couple of years due to the context. Um, 
but then I do think I do think that we're still being too shy in terms of not going out to say, well, it takes X amount of money to run Confidencial each year, and our goal is to have X amount of members so that we can be 100% member funded. Uh, and then there's a mixture there of shyness, but there's also what Cynthia is saying. It's kind of a security risk. I mean, if we go out and we're so blatantly open about how much it costs to run Confidencial, will that turn then into kind of a stigmatization campaign from government propaganda? Or will it turn into, or, or if we are so open about, well, yeah, right now we are 75% funded through grants, which we speak about selectively here and there, but we're not that open about it because then that feeds into this whole narrative that the government has about the criminalization of working with, let's say, philanthropic uh, funds and things like that. So, so I do think that in the near future, we will have to take that leap into being much more aggressive in the narrative in terms of how much it costs to do what we do and about our ambition to be 100% funded by our readers. We need to be, I mean, if, if we're not much more aggressive in putting that out there, then we can't really expect people to, to react and be activated by this call for help. Thank you. So the next lesson is uh, don't hesitate to explain to the audience not only your needs, but the real cost of this job. And it should be like their need for good information, not only our need for money. And another lesson is we should think about security of mm -hmm. our teams, but not only. And here I would like to understand from you if there are any risks for those who donate? Uh, could be they be disclosed by the power? Could they have any troubles with that? Do you want to answer? <laughs> well, here's the thing. I, I definitely think that there, there would be a risk. For audience, we should not discuss that. It was just yeah. a... No, look, I, I do think that there would be a risk in the sense that Solidarity is being completely criminalized in Nicaragua. I mean, we've seen it in other contexts. And even before the current crisis, I mean, there, there were moments of drought, for example, in 2016, in 2017, where uh, the smallholder farmer movement from a certain part of the country, where a lot of food is produced, was trying to take food to the other parts of the country that were suffering from drought, for example. And the police blocked them. Or in the context of COVID-19, uh, there was a major citizen mobilization to get uh, protective equipment to the public hospitals because the government was not providing it for uh, public health workers. And this was criminalized and the police were kind of confiscating and criminalizing people for solidarity. So I do think that there's a very real risk in terms of anybody that does something uh, out of solidarity supporting community movements or media outlets or anything that is not under control by the government runs a risk of being criminalized. And that is part of why so far, and, and it's also one of the bottlenecks to our growth, so far we've only been working with PayPal as a way to gather these membership payments because PayPal is completely outside of the jurisdiction of the government. So we do feel very safe about the fact that there is no way that the Nicaraguan government can have access to PayPal data as to who is contributing to us. But at the same time, that is a bottleneck to our growth. I mean, if we could just have, let's say, a normal online payment system through a regular Nicaraguan bank, for example, where people can just go in with their credit card and sign up for the membership, we would probably have a lot more members. Cynthia can tell you more about how much of a bottleneck that has been. But so far, our decision to be only on PayPal responds precisely to that need to keep our members safe. Very good. Thank you for thinking about them. Uh, let's go now for, for the next question about how do you keep the communication with, the, with these little donors? Uh, how much is too much? How much is not enough? Uh, meaning of giving them, do you provide them information like this month we had done these stories, uh, these stories costed that, or how do you communicate and keep uh, keep them informed 
and keep them around the team to to provide it constantly or maybe to to encourage others to join i think that um, a lot of these uh, strategies are based on your own inner voice <laughs> um i think it's it's you have to think if i were a subscriber of this database for example would i like to receive how many messages and how often and what kind of messages i think it's it's more about putting yourself in the shoes of, of the reader so i think a way of of being engaged is to i mean i'm a strong believer in newsletters <laughs> so if you have newsletters um i think it's you can combine either the campaigns that you can launch two times a month or one time a month. I mean, this is not a recipe that will fit everybody. It depends on your audience and how you feel that the audience reacts to you. So you can combine these campaigns in which you say, for example, today, like given Tuesday, this is a day that internationally people are used to getting these messages um, asking for help for organizations or media outlets. So you can launch that message or you can launch a specific campaign to um, gather funds to uh, replace equipment or to, re uh, to launch the redesign of a website, something very specific, and then have other newsletters that also include the messages that will position you know, uh, with the frequency that you send these emails, the message of subscribe to, I mean, join uh, our membership or donate. Uh, linking that into the endurance competition, it's about knowing that the person will see the message on and on and on and on in a sometimes not this guy's way, sometimes not, so that they have in their minds that they may join the membership or donate. Um, I can tell you that there are people who take about two to four months to join the membership program. And they have seen this, these messages or these campaigns, you know, uh, frequently. So um, newsletters and the databases, then the websites, super key please put the mess the automatic message at the end of your articles and on the on the home page we couldn't do that for for a long time because of multiple reasons but personally i saw that it did help a lot to have these automatic messages because then you have a combination of of the placing of the message depending on the platform where the audience is so the website and that, and that message, people see it every time they visit visit an article, and then if they're subscribed to the to the data, database, they will see it in in the newsletters. And if you have um, live broadcasting shows, then also do it there. So it's everywhere, but not so aggressively like this is the bank <laughs> that is after you. So. Um, yeah, I think, and also you have to experiment. You, you don't know how people are going to react unless you try. So if you see that a certain amount of people are complaining about too many emails, then listen and, and stop. And if you see that it actually, these messages work, then keep doing them and ask people, also ask the readers, uh, how often do you see it? Do you think that it was useful? Did it help you remind you that uh, you wanted to help us? Um, so I think it's a combination of a lot of factors. Great. So the lesson, the next lesson is put always a note or an announcement at the end of a good story. Yeah. And then keep informing them and asking them uh, how do they think and how do they feel? Good. So at the end of the day, who are them? Uh, do you have any data? Like, um, are they people with the university degree or are they um, 
um, top managers of something, or among them might be someone from Nicar Nicaragua government, or who are they? <laughs> Okay, so we have some uh, we have data that we collected through surveys. Also, big lesson: do surveys because that's first-hand information. It's not information incomplete information that social networks and even Google, Google and Analytics provides. This is information that people are willing to give you, and that it's very trustful, right? So. In, in the case of our audience, in the case of the people who are members or have donated more than two times, the majority of people are uh, between 55 and older. We have younger audiences, but the majority of people who are contributing are 55 and older, and they usually read the, the people who are in the membership program usually read in their desktop and they are more willing to donate about a hundred dollars. Um, also the survey um, showed us that these people are have a university de degree, the majority of them, and then there are people who have a master's degree and then a, a PhD. Um, if you correlate the information, you can conclude that, of course, the people who who are older have um, um, more money to invest, and of course, they are willing to renew their membership or the donation because we talk about you contribute however you can, right? So um, I think that that is. That is one of the key aspects of, of the data that we, we got through the surveys and also a challenge because we would like younger people, uh, young professionals to join the membership. And so we're trying to figure out ways to reach them maybe in different formats or with different benefits from the membership program. But as it is right now, uh, that is the data that we that we have. And sorry, because I forgot to say, um, a lot of them, the majority of them are Nicaraguans who live outside the country. Yes, I see. Yeah. Ah, thank you. So the next lesson is keep in mind and keep a good relation with people 55 plus. <laughs> because usually when we monitor our data, um, the biggest majority is reading from the mobile phone device, and uh, it means they read titles and, you know, easy stories or something. Uh, and there is a tiny number of uh, people who read from the desktop, and we always think, oh, oh gosh, who are they? Because you have to keep a good model uh, for the desktop as well. But from you now, I understood that they are very important people. They might be uh, the good donors, so good. Well, uh, Enrique, if I could, uh, do we have time? I think, do we have a few minutes more? Yes. Uh, if you could tell us what kind of reward do you offer to these people who donate? Yes, they get good content and they get a very good feeling to participate and to support something important for the society but if there is anything else you offer yeah so maybe um after i, I share some thoughts i want to also defer to cynthia because i think she has a, a much better uh, answer in terms of what we're currently offering to this membership audience but as cynthia and i were having a discussion yesterday to prepare for this conversation um we were talking about how this question in terms of what is the reward for members other than good content? Uh, you know, we just saw such a connection with a bigger question for us, which is what is the role of quality media outlets other than producing and distributing good content? I mean, I, we really believe that those two questions are inevitably intertwined. Um, so the, what I wanna get at is, yes, we, as, as we get better at 
articulating and expressing what our impact is, what the public value of quality journalism is, how quality journalism can contribute to a more democratic, a more fair society, uh, then we have a much more clear answer for what is the reward for members other than good content. Increasingly, we find that uh, the people who are donating or, or are part of the membership program are not doing it so much for the specific perks that they get, which Cynthia can talk about, but they're doing it because they believe in our mission and because they believe in this idea that our content has more impact if it's not behind the paywall and we need their help to keep our content open and free for everybody. So the hypothesis is, and I'm just gonna go for a moment back to the previous question. Um, we find in all of our loyalty products, our daily newsletter, uh, different surveys that we do, and obviously in the membership program, we do see kind of this, um, this skewing towards 55 older, we also have a lot uh, more, mid, at least in, let's say, answering surveys or subscribe to the newsletter, a lot more men than women, for example. So we're, we're asking ourselves, or, or we're coming to the conclusion that a lot of these people are maybe people who have been reading Confidencial for a long time, over the past 25 years. Traditionally, Confidencial was very much seen as kind of a, a niche outlet for decision makers in Nicaragua, and that has changed a lot over the last four years. So I think that we really need to become better at showing and telling the story of our impact, of what we do beyond making and distributing good content on how we contribute to empower citizens, to building democracy, even in an authoritarian context, and the better we get at showing and telling that story, I think that the more clear that it will be for people who join our community of support, what it is that they're getting beyond some perks. Absolutely great. Thank you very much. Because uh, often people think that uh, if someone contributes, uh, then you like, uh, not you, but the reporters or the newsroom should offer gifts or parties or something. But uh, I like very much what you said that, first of all, you should just keep, uh, keep them believe in your mission and uh, keep them informed about your impact. So this is the next le lesson. Thank you. Cynthia, would you, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, just... Um two comments the first one is to show you the the products that we have developed maybe i can share my screen so that the audience can see uh, what we share with the with the readers are you seeing my screen yeah yeah okay so this is the premium news newsletter and the premium newsletter what what it does is that it gives you like an early access to the content that's to the access to some of the content that we are going to publish in the website. And it, this is something that we already had also another lesson that we learned. Think about the products that you already have that can be useful um, in other formats. So this is the PDF of the printed magazine, the print the magazine had a, a subscription model um, and it was di distributed in Managua. And so we had a lot of people telling us we don't live in, in Nicaragua, how we can, how can we access this magazine? So we thought, yeah, this is the perfect product that we can give these people. So this is a PDF of the magazine and they can read. Um, it's like a collection also, like a product that you can collect for in your computer for the future, etc. This goes out every Saturday, and our uh, newsroom uh, writes this um, this content to give you, you know, an overview of what you're gonna read in the in the at the edition. And then this is the membership uh, newsletter, which I write. And what I try to do with this membership newsletter is to give content that other reader that like the readers in general uh, wouldn't have access to right in the beginning. We do publish this content afterwards. 
So I try to make a combination of uh, interviews with, um, with the team or to give a heads up of the projects that we're making. We're going to uh, redesign our website. So how is it going to look? Or when we launch our uh, membership website also, we even gave uh, the reader, the members access to the, the website so that they could tell us what they thought about the product. And um, by the end of 2020, we launched this website um, that is the website of the membership. Uh, and we explain why we would like you to join and what benefits you can have. And among those benefits is the digital archive of the magazine, um, which is in construction, huge work, 25 years. Our, um, our physical archive was confiscated, one of them. So we allied with the university who had all these files and we started digitalizing them. And also we have the, we have the ebooks. So this is also, these are also investigations that have already been published, but we compiled them and we launched ebooks uh, for people who haven't read these investigations and would like to have uh, something to collect and to read in another format. So um, this is the content. And there are, all, there are also other initiatives uh, like the webinars that we have been um, organizing throughout the year. And so what we do is to give early access for registration and also to be able to send questions to the, to the panelists. And, and then we open the re registration for everybody. So in general, everybody has access. So that is in general what we share. Thank you very much. Very good idea with the PDF. Uh, we do the same. Actually, we have a subscription and people may subscribe and get this PDF um, weekly. But also I had seen a good idea of how do you work with archives. And this is a good idea for us because we think we should use really archives to, to offer people uh, articles from other years and maybe also to offer them a subscription for the archives would be the yeah. lesson number 10 or something. <laughs> uh, well, we are going to the end of this session. So for now, actually, my question would be uh, if, it, if you would start it tomorrow from the beginning, what are the mistakes to avoid, <laughs> if there are any, of course? So um, I think that part of the answer is actually very much linked to one of the questions that we got from, the, from Laura, from Mutante. So I'll also bring that into it. Uh, Laura was asking kind of about the, this difference between a membership where maybe the perks, in this case, she's mentioning uh, the possibility to participate in editorial meetings, for example, uh, haven't been, it, it seems like they haven't been that attractive to some people, but people are willing to donate. So they have this kind of debate between donation campaign and membership program. And when we were, when Cynthia and I were speaking yesterday, we definitely have come to the conclusion, we did a donation campaign as a prototype of the membership model. Then we launched, we launched the membership model, but then we ended up creating a hybrid where really it's, if you want to help by donating and acquiring a membership seems to you like too much involvement or like buying benefits that you're not necessarily going to use, that can be a psychological barrier for some people. So now we are increasingly mixing these, these two things. Uh, so that would be number one thing. I think that number one thing that uh, I would put on the table is not making such a clear distinction between donations and memberships and sort of trying to create a community of support where people can go through different channels, whatever, whatever works best for them. Uh, that's one lesson uh, that or one thing that we might have done differently. A second thing that I would put on the table is, um, so we have learned over these years that the place where we can convert more people towards donations or memberships is our daily newsletter. And yet our daily newsletter is our slowest growing product, still is now. So right now we're really asking ourselves, well, uh, you know, we haven't paid attention to this key part of the conversion funnel 
what are we going to do over the next months to really increase the growth of our daily newsletter? Because that is an early indicator of conversions towards our membership model. So it's three years we have lost. We should have been focusing at least just as intensely on the growth of our daily newsletter that we haven't. So there's a harsh lesson. We paid the price for it. Hopefully you won't have to. Uh, and then a third thing that I would put on the table, maybe the hardest thing of all, but Cynthia and I have been talking a lot about this recently, is if we believe, so for us, the membership model is more than a sustainability initiative. For us, it really is this space where we want to promote participation from our audience. We want our audience to ownership, a sense of ownership with regards to our media outlet. Um, and we are increasingly having this debate of we, you know, we came up with this great ebook. 300 people are reading it because so far we're doing it membership only. So this whole idea that we have of all our, all our content being open, of Nicaragua being a very, you know, very poverty, very, very poverty stricken and very unequal society. So our content needs to be open. So the closer we get to this ideal of our membership model being a participation space, it doesn't make sense for us for that to also be behind the paywall. So how can we, again, it goes back to that question of what does an outlet do beyond producing and, and distributing content? What do members get beyond content? So I think that as we get better at really creating this participation space within our membership model, the more inclined we will be to also open that up. Maybe we will ask people to contribute in other ways. So like participate in surveys or participate in opinion panels or write your opinion for this kind of members blog. So we're trying to find another currency other than money, maybe participation, trust as the, you know, this conversation is framed within trust. Uh, so how can we turn our membership model into something that is also more inclusive, also has more impact in terms of participation and sense of ownership and sense of being heard, which is something that is very much needed in our society. And as we do that, we will get more people who can either donate to one of the membership levels or just make one-time donations. So that's, those are kind of the three things that I would put on the table. I don't know, Cynthia, if I'm missing something for this question. Many, there are many other, <laughs> many, so many other things, but I think those are the most important ones. I think that also, if we could do all over, things all over again, I think, I mean, we have to recognize the fact that we were reacting to a context. So that meant, very little time to think, to plan, you know, um, in the beginning, at least. So I think in the beginning, because we were, um, yeah, we were being pressured from all sides. Uh, we were thinking about the goal in monetary, in a monetary sense of things. And donation campaigns are, I like, are like that, you know, how, how much can you collect? But then when we launched the membership uh, program, the, the challenge was to think not, in, not, not only in money, but also in participation in how many members do you get every month and how many members do you aspire to have by the end of the year? And how are you going to think not only on how to get new members, but also to, to, you know, to keep them in the membership. I mean, it's a world that if you, if you study journalism, these are not the things that the teachers teach you. <laughs> this is something that you learn on the way. And of course, the past is already, has already happened, but I think that would have been one of the things that, that we could have changed. And also to envision um, the need that there is going to be uh, about having a team that can run the membership and the donation. Because um, it started with me, then it grew, but th there are situations in which you think, ah, <laughs> this is a lot. <laughs> How can I cover everything? You manage. 
but of course if you have help it's better and so we have we, we have uh, we have been growing um but i think that if you have that in mind and you plan the growth is is it's better also um yeah yeah, it was good to, to learn that uh, you should not only plan how much money you want, but you should know how much effort you put and you should plan uh, people who will work with that. And one of the last but not the least lesson is uh, journalist schools should add a lesson like this we had today uh, in the curricula because this is the thing that uh, all journalists should understand. We have a last question from Camila. Yeah. Uh, maybe you see it or I read it. How you plan the time between the content uh, is finished, upload to the web and send the premium newsletter to the, and the time when you present it to the audience. Okay. Should I reply or you? Okay. Um, I think we have some advantage because because Confidencial started as a printed magazine. So there have we have years of having this routine, let's say, put, let's put it that way, in which the newsroom plans the topics for the magazine. And so um, a portion of the work is, uh, uh, revolves around publishing the magazine. So this, this happens throughout a week. And then um, the, the magazine is designed uh, between Friday and Saturday. And so as soon as, as the, the PDF is ready, um, the newsroom writes the message and sends it. I think that helps us a lot because if not, we would have had to change certain uh, the, the workflows, right? But um, there are other other things that you cannot plan, like the membership. Uh, no, you cannot always plan like the membership um, uh, newsletter. And so that is why it is important to have someone who creates content, because then I come up with ideas of what we can publish in this newsletter. And so this content is exclusive for that audience. And then we share it with with the rest of the audience so there are two dynamics depending on the product that you that you want to send sorry just very quickly also not, not to leave Laura's last question unanswered uh, our membership model grows slowly every month and then it takes big jumps out of specific campaigns but there are two kinds of specific campaigns there are those that we come up with uh, and those are slightly less successful than those that are contextual. So it's like, if it's the specific campaign of, hey, we just got raided by the police for the second time, uh, and we need to rebuy cameras and computers, we get a huge boost. If it's kind of like, well, here we have a special campaign, a new ebook sign up, those are slightly less, um, obviously, successful than these big contextual ones. Yeah, but all in all, uh, it looks very good. You gave a very good story of uh, making journalism in such a difficult uh, situation. So it, it was the moment, maybe I'm sorry to say, we give up because uh, we have nothing. But then uh, you just understood that you have a community and then you got everything back or a lot back. Uh, there is still a lot of work. So thank you very, very much for this uh, very good discussion, uh, very inspiring. We do not, we are not arrested yet here, but uh, there are a lot of things about to think and uh, also to develop in our newsroom. So uh, if, uh, Evelyn, do you have any remarks at the end? What no. I am inspired today. <laughs> Well, Alina, thank you so much for summarizing all these lessons. I did not expect you <laughs> to do that. It was very, very clear that way. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for, uh, for sharing and for joining today. It's really appreciated. So uh, I hope to be in touch soon with, with each and every one of you. Yeah, thank and you if anybody in the audience would have any questions to Enrique or Cynthia or maybe to me, yeah, would be glad to, to answer.
Yes, I, I put in the chat that uh, people who want to receive your contact details can email me directly so that uh, I can give it to them safely. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. And you there have a nice day. Those here, let's have a nice evening. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, we just start a new thing with everybody together because everybody had learned new lessons today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great Thank you so much, Alina. Bye. Bye, Evelyn. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you so Bye. Much.